Chris. This is the Congress of Vienna. Let's get into this video. I'm just joking. Um, this is a request. Don't remember the name. I apologize. I am losing track of a lot of the requests. So if you've requested something and I haven't seen it, please request it again. I'm trying to scroll through and find things, but this uh, YouTube app that they have me do um, it's, it's just difficult to navigate because it just it's comments and I, I'm, I probably am just not smart enough to use it yet so anyways it's hot outside it's hot outside so uh, I had to kick my air off and we're going to go ahead and um, get started on this this is going to be a two parter I'm going to stop at about the 23 minute mark um, and uh Words, words, words. Let's go. By the summer of 1814, the combined strength of Europe brought France to its knees. After almost 25 years of war, Europe was finally at peace. Nobody knew this at the time, but the peace that was negotiated here and now served as the launching pad for a 99-year run without a major war between great powers. A monumental achievement. Mostly. After hostilities ceased, the immediate problem was that nobody quite knew what the world looked like anymore. The preliminary peace agreement that ended the war in 1814 restored international borders as they had existed in 1792, with some slight modifications. But these borders on the map no longer reflected the reality on the ground. The Duchy of Warsaw, aka Poland, existed on paper, but in reality it was under Russian occupation. All of these tiny German states existed on paper, but in reality they were under Prussian control. France existed on paper, but in reality it was under the joint occupation of the Russians, the Austrians, the Prussians, and the British. All that being said, by the summer of 1814, the Treaty of Paris had been signed, the 1792 borders had been temporarily thrown back into place, and the war was over, at least for now. The urgent task at hand was to take this hyper-volatile international system and transform it into something more stable. Most people recognized that the 1792 borders were no good in the long run, because those borders had led directly to almost 25 years of war. The prevailing mood among the victors was that a- If they were 25 years of war, then why did they just do it? Was it to end fighting and they hoped that maybe in the peacetime they could work on it or was it just a let's get peace and there shouldn't be another issue again what would be i'm gonna guess probably to let's just end any wars and then we can work on it down the road which what's the incentive other than a war well balanced international system was necessary one that could resist the kind of reckless expansionism that the French Revolution had unleashed upon the world. It's a big boy. But before we talk about the new system that was created at this time, let's first discuss the five great powers as they existed in 1814. Um, England, 1814, England, France, Russia, Spain, Germany, or was Germany around, was that Prussia? I'm going to go Prussia. England, France, Spain, Prussia, Russia. Let's see. This whole period of instability began with the French Revolution, so let's start with France. Defeated, under enemy occupation, but nevertheless, still a great power. When Napoleon was defeated, the Allied victors imposed a set of peace conditions upon France. 
all things considered, they were pretty moderate. The first of these called for the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy from before the revolution. This brought the 58-year-old King Louis XVIII to the throne, the younger brother to the king that was executed under the revolution. The second condition for peace was a shiny new French constitution that would guarantee certain political rights. The third condition was an agreement from the new king to leave many of the revolutionary reforms in place. The massive redistribution of wealth and land was to be mostly upheld by the new regime. So it goes. The old French aristocracy were allowed to safely return to the country, but they were a shadow of their former selves, and never again rose to the dominant political position that they had enjoyed in the 18th century. The restoration of the Bourbon king was intended to make the conservatives happy. The new constitution was intended to make the moderate liberals happy. The preservation of the republican reforms was intended to make the revolutionaries happy. It was a big, sloppy compromise, and its purpose was to hold France together so that there was actually a France for the Allies to negotiate with. Okay, interesting. Despite its... I didn't do anything. Oh. Straight to this. Ah. Despite its recent... Um, this is completely off topic, but right here, oh, I'm sorry, it says metal can. In case some of you at home were wondering what I was drinking out of, um, you know, you're probably looking at it and thinking, oh, he's drinking out of a, you know, like a, a burlap sack. Nope. Cheesecloth? No. Baby hands? No. Nope. A bald eagle's beak? Nope. Well, I, I'm, I'm out of guesses. No, it's a metal can. Fooled every single one of you. My apologies, back to the video. In defeat, France remained a heavyweight on the continent. They were the second most populous country in Europe and still controlled the most potent military force in the world. So long as those facts remained true, France would remain a great power. With that in mind, France's objective going into the upcoming peace negotiations was to the extent possible, minimize any future French concessions or territorial losses. Many European leaders understood that France would need to opt in to any new international system if there was to be lasting peace. Others were simply out for blood. France's job for the immediate future would be to keep the wolves at bay. To this end, the new king brought in an experienced hand to serve as his foreign minister, Talleyrand. Talleyrand was a French nobleman who got in on the ground floor of the French Revolution. Through the revolution, he became a politician, then a diplomat, then an early supporter of Napoleon. Talleyrand served as Napoleon's foreign minister for eight years, until the two had a falling out and Talleyrand resigned. After this, Talleyrand began telling others that Napoleon's endless lust for war would bring ruin upon France. In time, he began <laughs> passing intelligence to France's enemies and launched preliminary discussions with them regarding what a post-Napoleonic France might look like. This relate Dude lost his marbles. That's that's actually a quote. I can tell. Relationship made him an obvious choice to bring back into government after France was defeated. That's the generous way of looking at Talleyrand. The ungenerous way of looking at him is that he was a cockroach, a survivor, an opportunist. Every time the political winds began to shift, Talleyrand suddenly found himself on the other side. Wow. Every time the French government looked unstable, Talleyrand found an excuse to be out of the country. When it became clear that France would not win the war, Talleyrand was the first to abandon ship. But He's like seaweed. He just goes with the motion, like whatever, he's fine that way. He's no Udino. 36 bullets. I'm still talking about that. Boats. That video aired, uh, uh, premiered today, and there were some comments, and that guy has never left my thoughts. <laughs>
but no matter what you think of him, Talleyrand became the most powerful person in the French government after the fall of Napoleon. And yes, I am including the king when I say that. His great task as foreign minister would be to keep the wolves at bay and reintegrate France back into the international order as a co-equal great power. Let's now turn our attention to the four great powers that brought Napoleonic France to its knees, starting with the greatest of the great powers and working our way down. Okay, so I'm two. That one was an easy one. As always, the historian Eric Hobsbawm puts it better than I ever could. Britain, quote, had by 1815 gained the most complete victory of any power in the entire history of the world, having emerged from 20 years of war against France as the only industrialized economy, the only naval power, and virtually the only colonial power in the world. The thing that made Britain the greatest of the great powers was the Royal Navy. Sometimes people talk about strategic depth, which is the idea that during wartime, you want the lines of battle drawn as far from your major population centers as possible. In 1815, Britain's strategic depth extended to all the world's oceans and beyond. No country has ever been safer from invasion. The moment of I had the fan going, sorry. The moment of Britain's great victory was also a moment of great uncertainty for the British monarchy. George III was king and was unable to enjoy Britain's newfound prosperity. George probably suffered from a number of genetic disorders, as well as other things like bipolar disorder and dementia. At times, it was quite bad. He was in constant physical pain and suffered from hallucinations, delusions, and memory loss. He was occasionally coherent, but not often, and not for long. In 1811, at the height of the war, the British Parliament transferred the powers of the monarchy to the king's 48-year-old son, which made him the Prince Regent. Within a few years, the king was no longer presentable enough to appear in public. Britain's dominant geopolitical position was all the more impressive considering the fact that of the five great powers, Britain was the fourth most populous. But the picture becomes more clear when you look at wealth. In 1815, the British people were on average the wealthiest people in the world, at least 50% wealthier than their counterparts on the continent. Wow. This trend would continue for the rest of the century, and by the year 1900, they would be almost twice as wealthy as the average European. This incredible wealth and geopolitical security helped produce a uniquely robust political culture with lively debates and an informed electorate. In 1815, the British Prime Minister was the Earl of Liverpool, a kind of centrist conservative. The fact that he was kind of conservative was a huge deal. It was the manifestation of a seismic shift going on within British politics. Let me explain why. Since the 17th century, there had been two political factions within the British Parliament. The Whigs, a liberal faction who favored giving Parliament more power, and the Tories, a conservative faction who favored giving the King more power. England in the 17th century was utterly consumed by the power struggle between these two factions. They even fought a civil war over it. Over the course of this struggle, England swung wildly between having an authoritarian king and no king at all, sending one to the grave and another into exile. By the end of the 17th century, the question was settled. The Whigs won. Parliament became the supreme political authority in England, and the monarchy began to fade into the background. This brought about a really strange period in British politics, something that will never happen again. For more than a hundred years, every British Prime Minister was a Whig. This period is sometimes called the Whig Supremacy or the Whig Domination, sometimes even the Whig Oligarchy. I like the term Whig oligarchy because it gets at one of the key political truths of this period. 
I described the Whigs as the faction of Parliament, but it might be more accurate to describe them as the faction of modernity and industrialization. This meant that Whig political power emanated from cities and business and capital, while Tory political power emanated from aristocratic landowners and the countryside. At the time, the Whig modernist and pro-business worldview called for free trade and religious toleration, alongside a slow and steady expansion of political rights. The Whigs had a general distaste for slavery in all its forms, even while they continued to participate in the business of slavery. So for more than a hundred years, the Whigs dominated British politics, and for the first 50 or 60 years, there were basically no close elections. The Whigs routinely won 300 to 400 seats in Parliament, and the other factions were lucky to break 100. With such a dominant command over Parliament, it was only a matter of time before the Whig faction started to develop its own factions, and then factions within factions, and then factions within factions within factions. This competition between sub-factions actually made elections competitive again, and in the 1770s, Britain elected its first Whig Prime Minister from the conservative sub-faction. During the French Revolution, perhaps in reaction to the French Revolution, Britain elected several more conservative Whig Prime Ministers. But they all took great care to calm people's nerves and make it clear that they were all still Whigs. They were all members of one big political party. One was brave enough to brand himself as an independent Whig, whatever that means, but nobody dared go any further. So by 1814, Lord Liverpool, another conservative Whig, was Prime Minister. But he was in an impossible situation. His conservative Whig majority in Parliament was modest, and his sub-faction seemed to be falling apart. Four men were asked to form a government before him, and all four failed to hold the coalition together. The only reason Liverpool was able to get the job done was because although he was a conservative Whig, he was on the liberal end of the conservative Whig spectrum. I spoke of factions within factions within factions before. I was not joking. As soon as P- I feel like I'm spending way too much time dealing with other people's problems. Yep. How do I set boundaries with them? Would you like me to set an alarm? As soon as peace was announced, protests started popping up all over England calling for bread or blood. One publication at the time wrote that, quote, all the triumphant sensations of national glory seem almost obliterated by general depression. Change was in the air. It was not a good time to be a conservative politician in Britain. In fact, it seemed entirely possible that the conservative Whig moment was simply a reaction to the French Revolution. And with peace, the liberal Whig natural order may just reassert itself. All of that is simply a long-winded way of saying that when it was time to negotiate with the other great powers, Liverpool found himself politically constrained from every direction. If the negotiations went badly, he could not only be thrown out of government, but the conservative Whig sub-faction could be wiped out forever. The peace negotiations would be handled by the British Foreign Secretary, the Viscount of Castlereagh. Castlereagh had strong opinions when it came to Europe. There were some pro-war nuts in the conservative Whig sub-faction, but he was not one of them. Castlereagh's view was that every British intervention on the continent was a colossal policy failure. If he had his way, Britain would never again send an army to Europe. One of the reasons Castlereagh thought this way is because he was an imperialist. As Hobsbawm said, Britain at this time was virtually the only colonial power in the world. Some of the more liberal Whigs had mixed feelings about that, but Castlereagh didn't. He thought it was awesome. He believed that Britain's future was out in the colonies, and it would be best for Britain if Europe remained stable and peaceful and boring. There was some hypocrisy at work here. Peace between the great powers meant that nobody was allowed to touch any of Britain's new conquests. Peace between the great powers meant that Britain could instead maintain its advantage and focus on making money off of its colonies. 
All of that being said, Liverpool and Castle. There will be peace, just keep your hands off of our stuff. Ray genuinely <laughs> wanted peace. The British public had been exhausted by the war, and if the conservative Whigs wanted to maintain their majority, they were going to have to show some results. Together, Liverpool and Castlereagh came up with a list of specific goals for the upcoming negotiations. The most important item was that they wanted the Netherlands reformed and strengthened on the English Channel. Two reasons for this. First, they wanted an ally on the continent to break up any consolidation along the coast. Second, this was historically a natural path for French expansion, and going forward, the British wanted to cut that off. Along these same lines, they also wanted the French out of Spain, and Spain restored to its previous borders under its previous monarch. Castlereagh also had instructions to make sure that the new peace deal would keep Italy free from French influence. Historically, every time the French started messing around with Italy, it meant that France was becoming way too powerful. No more. Going forward, Italy would be a red line. Castlereagh had other goals as well. But the big ones were... So basically their goal was just to box France in so it can't get all crazy again. All about containing France. Yep, that's Before what I said. Before the peace <laughs> negotiations began, Castlereagh back-channeled his list of priorities to both Austria and Prussia, and got from them an unofficial thumbs up. At least two of the other great powers wouldn't oppose any of Britain's big-ticket items. And that was probably because... Austria and Prussia had both just fought France. You know, they fought Napoleon because of 1814. So he's probably around this time in exile. Yeah, yeah, of course he is. They got the other king there. And he hasn't come back yet. So yeah, all these other people, all these other countries are like, yeah, what it just let's just let's just get France on board to not do this anymore. So yeah, I can understand that. Why, especially why the other countries would be on board with that. I'm sure not all. And but. France wasn't exactly in a place to put up much of a fight. The only remaining unknown going into the negotiations was Russia. Nobody quite knew what they wanted or what their intentions were. I didn't do anything. Intentions were. <laughs> Russia. Okay, so I'm 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 on three now. Which these three were easy. When Castlereagh met Tsar Alexander of Russia for the first time, he wrote to his prime minister that he believed that the Russian monarch was not of sound mind. <laughs> it's difficult to characterize Tsar Alexander because it seems that most of his mental energy was caught up in creating narratives about what kind of person he was and not so much in what he did or how he behaved. The thing that confused Castlereagh, and confuses me to be honest, is that Alexander had 8 or 10 of these narratives going through his head at the same time, and wasn't particularly bothered when they contradicted each other. Let me give you some specific examples. Please do. Alexander considered himself a true Enlightenment monarch, and told anybody who would listen that he believed in a limited constitutional monarchy, and wanted Russia to have elections, and a parliament, and independent courts. At the same time, he ruled Russia as a tyrannical dictator, which was justified in his mind because he believed that he was God's chosen instrument on Earth. These two. This is the Alexander from. Oh, the Decemberists, if I'm thinking correctly. I believe so, because I thought the guy was had some good ideas and all of a sudden he just kind of changed. If this is that guy that I'm thinking of, if I'm correct, which I'm sure I'm not. Two thoughts are not compatible, but Alexander did not see a contradiction. He would simply switch between these two modes of thought, depending on who he was talking to and how he felt that day. Here's okay. another example. Alexander believed himself to be the most honorable man in Europe. A man who revered ritual, and tradition, and justice. Simultaneously, he believed that God made him Emperor of Russia for a reason, and if he needed to go back on his word and use brute force to implement his will, that was all part of God's plan. 
These contradictory beliefs okay. made Alexander impossible to deal with. His positions came off as utterly random, and they could change at any time, depending on his mood. He was unpredictable and unreliable and incomprehensible, particularly bad traits for a diplomat. So naturally, Alexander selected himself to represent Russia at the post-war peace conference. Of course. As the most populous country in Europe, Russia was a formidable land power. But that inherent strength was undercut by weak institutions, weak governance, and the fact that Russia remained a technological backwater. This backwardness had always been a source of immense insecurity for Russian monarchs. But by 1814, all that insecurity was gone. Russia had just done the impossible and defeated Napoleon. At least, in their own imagination, that's what happened. The truth is a little more complicated. Years Ru of careful di Russia and Russia alone <laughs> diplomacy had laid the groundwork for a coordinated attack against the French, and Napoleon's disastrous invasion of Russia was simply the catalyst. Had yeah. Napoleon been successful in Russia, the rest of Europe's great powers would have just waited for the next opportunity. But when the French started losing to Russia, most of Europe sprang into action. The plan was for every major European army to advance on Paris at a steady pace, but to pull back whenever opposed by the French army. The Allies knew that they couldn't defeat Napoleon on the battlefield, but with all of Europe's armies advancing as one, they wouldn't have to. Napoleon couldn't be everywhere at once. Even if he won every possible battle, the Allies would still take Paris. The point is that no one country defeated Napoleon. Every country defeated Napoleon. But Tsar Alexander didn't see it like this. In his <laughs> mind, it was all his doing. As part of their plan, the Allies had developed lists of key French towns to capture on the way to Paris. The Allied armies would need their logistical support, especially with several French armies coming up behind them. Tsar Alexander was personally in command of the Russian army. And once he was within spitting distance of French territory, he abandoned this plan and broke off from his allies and advanced on Paris alone. Alexander later said that this was a matter of personal honor. Never mind the commitment to his allies to all advance as one. Apparently personal honor can only go so far. It was Tsar Alexander of Russia who took Paris, and it was Tsar Alexander who accepted Napoleon's surrender. Since Alexander placed himself in the center of the action, the fact that he liked to tell conflicting narratives about himself suddenly became very important to world history. On one hand, Alexander styled himself as the grand enemy of the French, as Napoleon finally meeting his match on the field of battle. On the other hand, Alexander still believed that he was the most honorable man in Europe. Spin the randomizer and what do we get? Honor. Today, Alexander would treat Napoleon not as the enemy of Europe, but as his equal, the Emperor of Russia meeting with the Emperor of France. It was as equals that Alexander negotiated Napoleon's surrender. And as equals, Alexander gave Napoleon almost everything he wanted. Napoleon would be allowed to retain the title of Emperor, and would be permitted to remain an independent monarch until his death ruling over the small island of Elba off the coast of Italy. He wouldn't be allowed to leave, but on the island, he would be a free man. The Allies were apoplectic. This was not what they had agreed to. This put the British in particular in a terrible position because they had deliberately never recognized Napoleon as the legitimate emperor of France. Now, for some reason, the Russian Tsar was forcing them to legitimize Napoleon only in defeat. It was humiliating. When the rest of the Allies arrived in Paris, several of their leaders got up in Alexander's face and went ballistic. 
Alexander was in a different mood that day and gave them a placid response, saying that it was his duty as a Christian to forgive his enemies. This is what made Alexander impossible to deal with. Today, he was saying that Napoleon had to remain an emperor for religious reasons. Yesterday, it was because of honor and tradition. Tomorrow, who knows? The Austrian foreign minister summarized these events in a report to his monarch, in which he called Alexander, and this is a real quote, the biggest baby on earth. He continued, quote, He has started out by doing a great deal of harm. We have repaired some of it, but we will suffer for some time as a result of those things he got up to in those first moments when he got away from us. Alexander's stated priorities going into the peace conference kinda depended on his mood, but it mostly had to do with the future of France. As previously discussed, the Allies had all agreed to restore the old Bourbon dynasty to the French throne. The problem was that Alexander didn't like the Bourbon kings. If you look at France's position in Europe, France had an interest in making sure that Central Europe remained fragmented and weak, and outside of the influence of any other great power. To these ends, France had a long history of aligning itself with countries like Poland and Saxony and the Ottoman Empire. This was, of course, a geopolitical thing, but Tsar Alexander thought it was a personal thing and that the Bourbon kings uniquely had a problem with Russia. Alexander's immediate priority was to keep the Bourbon Louis XVIII off of the French throne. He suggested making Napoleon's four-year-old son the king of France, but Talleyrand patiently explained to him that this would allow Napoleon to pull the strings from exile. Yeah. Alexander then tried to put a man named Bernadotte on the French throne. Bernadotte was a former French marshal who had turned against Napoleon and was single-handedly responsible for bringing Sweden into the coalition against France. In the late stages of the war, Bernadotte and Alexander had worked closely together, and Alexander viewed him as the one Frenchman he could trust. Alexander pushed hard for Bernadotte, but Talleyrand wouldn't budge. He and the Allies had all agreed on a Bourbon restoration, and they all saw Bernadotte for what he was an attempt to put a Russian puppet on the French throne. Talleyrand explained to Alexander that they couldn't be placing whomever they wished on the French throne, or they were no better than the revolutionaries. The new king needed to be a legitimate French king of royal blood. Alexander got desperate. What about a distant cousin, a younger brother, anybody but Louis XVIII? Talleyrand held firm, and Alexander backed down. An impressive feat, considering that the Russians had Paris under military occupation. A Bourbon king would return to the French throne, and Alexander's dream of a grand Franco-Russian alliance withered and died. Austria. I didn't think of Austria until they, they mentioned it. I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. Um, I was just waiting for the Russian part to get over. Um, looks like it's going to be an ad as soon as we start, but Austria. That makes sense. So, okay. My nose itches. So we're going to go ahead and end this here. And um, it's going to end for you. But I'm going to be right back in about two minutes to actually start filming again. So, you should have a good day. Have a good night.